Brent. So um, yeah, I think we can we can start. Um, welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to um, to welcome you to this ISA panel on social equality, sports within the context of um, protest, COVID nineteen, the pandemic. Um, we have four excellent presenters. My name is Jacob van Sterkenberg. I'm uh, from the Netherlands. It's two o'clock here in the afternoon, but I do see, I realize that many of you um, are not that comfortable in terms of the time zone. Um, <laughs> our presenters also come from different continents, which of course is, is, is great. Um, Brent McDonald is the organizer of the session um, and he managed to really yeah, get four excellent um, experts on this topic and uh, I will introduce them in a moment. Brent is also the one who is the host of this session, so uh, he kind of is there all the time, um, also taking care that everything runs smoothly, and I'm the one who, who's doing the moderating uh, of the session. Before going to the, um, the presenters and introducing them, let me say a first, um, first of all a few things, more, more or less housekeeping rules. Um, first, like Brent said, I mean, the, the event is recorded, so um, yeah, if you participate, uh, it means you give your permission to, to be recorded. You can, of course, turn off your video or use other initials. That's, that's of course, perfectly fine. Um, so that's an important thing, I guess, to mention. Then the order of today, today's panel. Um, right now, we're in the first five minutes of, of the introduction. Then there will be presentations, 10 minutes for each presentation. Um, and then yeah, something happened on my screen, and yeah, the, and then then the um, the um, the Q and A will will start after the presentations, so it means we have four presentations, and only after that the, the questions will come. The thing is, we had some, you know, one other ISA panel had some problems with um, Zoom bombing, some people, unexpected guests coming in, so that changed a little bit the policies of these panels, which now means that there is um, a host who. Yeah, kind of, it's the only one who can unmute um, you when you want to speak. For that reason, it's most, uh, it works best, it's most practical if uh, you ask your questions, if you have questions during the presentations, please ask them uh, by using the chat function in Zoom, right? It's just one of the functions you can see uh, at the bottom of your, of your Zoom screen. And then I will be the one also um, having the chat open. So I will collect your questions uh, as good as I can, and uh, after the presenters have done their presentations, I will be also the one asking the questions um, to them on behalf of you, right? So that's that's how it will work. Otherwise, it's too it's too um, um, yeah difficult for for Brent in this case to unmute all the time one person uh, uh, while you cannot even see everyone on the screen, right? So that's that's um, that's how we are going to do it. But please, I would encourage you to use the chat function to ask questions because we do see them. And I will take care of them and I will ask these questions. Um, good, so that's uh, about housekeeping. Let's go now to the real content. Um, so it's a real privilege to, to, to moderate the session because now we have, first of all, and this is a special thanks, I would say. First of all, we have Akila carter francique from uh, San Jose University, US. Uh, the reason I say a special thanks is that she has got up really early um, for doing this. I think it's 5 a.m. in the morning uh, um, there. So we are uh, we appreciate this 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 very much uh, that you're here and, and that you you can share with us uh, your presentation um, as the first presenter. Then second um, uh, today we have Professor Kevin Hilton. Um, he's with Leeds Beckett University, and he is not here yet, but he promised us to um, join on time. He had another uh, he chaired he had to chair another meeting in the UK. Um, so he will be the second one presenting today. Um, then after that, we have Barry Jett from um, Australia, Charles Darwin University. So as I said, we have people from four, four presenters from four different continents. Um, <laughs> he's the third one. The fourth presenter will be Sean Chen from the National Taiwan Sport University. And um, I, I will leave it up to the presenters to yeah, kind of introduce themselves in a bit more detail. Uh, I think that that works best. Ah, I see also that our second presenter Kevin Hilton has joined. Welcome, Kevin. Um, okay. So um, the, the presenters will, will share their slides with you and um, uh, Brent will unmute them when, they, uh, when they're going to present. Um, so yeah, I wanna give the floor to our first presenter. Um, Akila, please, the floor is yours. And again, please, I encourage you to really ask questions in the chat. I have it open now, so Brent and I, we can see them. 
Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Got a little something before we get into it. Um, so if you can sit tight with me for about a minute or so. I've been walking with my face turned to the sun. <clears throat> on my shoulders my fun buffering <laughs> a bullet in I say segregation now segregation tomorrow and oh, I got eyes in the back of my head just in case I had I do what I can when I can while I can for my people While the clouds roll back and the stars fill the night I That's have a dream. where I'm gonna stand up Take my people with me Together we are going into a brand new dream. home Far across the river Can you hear free? And feel it in my bones. And I'll fight with the strength that I got until I die. So I'm gonna stand up, hard to take my love. people I have with me. Together we are going to a brand the new down. home. Far the across the river. river, can you I hear freedom me. call? So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, <laughs> wherever you are. I'm Dr. Akila Carter Francy coming to you from San Jose State University and California. It's 5 a.m. here, <laughs> um, but happy, happy to be here nonetheless. Can everybody hear me okay? I just want to make sure. Okay, good. So I'm bringing to you today a presentation, Stand Up, Reimagining the Role of Equity, Social Change, and Activism in Sport. Um, that, uh, you know, got brought into this panel, didn't really know what to speak about. So much has happened here in the U.S. So much has happened um, in our own San Jose um, and even what we do with the Institute for Sports Society and Social Change. So my goal today is to really sort of um, contextualize the efforts of engagement of activism that erupted in the U.S. Um, over the past several months in the wake of COVID-19 and racial un unrest following the killings of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, particularly to discuss the need to reimagine our collective understanding of equity, social change, and the role of activism in the world um, and through sport. So I'll provide some insights that are really going to lean on um, the, the work on uh, teachings of C. Wright Mills, um, conception of sociological imagination, and the lessons learned from past social movements like the civil rights movement. In order to stay on time, I'm also going to be reading from my notes so I can um, stay on track. With that said, on May 25th, 2020, George Floyd, a 46-year-old African-American man, was killed in Minneapolis, Minnesota, while being arrested for allegedly using counterfeit bill. Derek Chauvin, a white police officer with the Minneapolis Police Department, knelt on Floyd's neck for what was found to be eight minutes and 48 seconds after he was already handcuffed and lying face down. It is difficult for me to fathom, and it's difficult for me really to, to understand um, what uh, eight minutes and 46 seconds um, feels like, feel that I can't breathe, calling for my mother, and in many ways knowing that I won't see my children again. I am equally challenged as a sister to think my brother could be killed sitting in his home. As a daughter, my mother would not be with me 
um, as she's killed, um, you know, waking up or sleeping in her bed at night. And that as a wife, that my husband, who's an Olympian, could go for a daily jog and not return home. Over the past few months, sport has really served as a metaphor in real life contested terrain as a microcosm of society. So we're here today holding this conversation because of the literal and figure, figurative constriction of air and knee on the neck of people of color and women and groups that have been historically or traditionally not been in positions of power. Uh, more germane to the title of this presentation is the notion of imagination. Thinking of the work of C. Wright Mills, um, conception of that, I feel that it's an appropriate time to seek having this imagination and standing apart mentally from our place in society and seeing or imagining, if you will, the linkage between personal or biography and historical or social events, ultimately tracing the connections between patterns and events that live in our own lives and our society. So three of the things I wanted to sort of illuminate as we, we talk about this is just these conceptions of sociological imagination. The first thing I wanna to bring to you is this notion of equity talking about at this state, the quality or ideal of being just, impartial and fair. The conception of equity is really synonymous with this notion of fairness um, and justice. And so in, in thinking about this sociological imagination, um, it's really come to mind because with the Institute, we have had the opportunity to onboard 10, 10 undergraduate and graduate students to our internship program with the Institute. We've had the opportunity to work with them week by week with my colleague, Dr. Amy August, my colleague Beth Doyle, and helping to sort of unpack some of the issues and interests they have um, and being activists. In addition, um, we, we are working with um, some students from our student athlete group um, in particular that have a real true interest in social justice and social change. And so one of the things, the question I think that was posed was, you know, um, is this a time for change? Will it switch over? And I think it, it is. Um, I'm hopefully through these conversations, we'll do that. But in order to do that, in order to see uh, the needle move, if you will, we've got to sort of speak into this notion of um, history and understanding um, what it is. Having as attention to history is valuable, not only to predict the future, as Mill says, but to understand the present better. Uh, for me, as I look, look at this, it's this notion of being able to understand equity, in particular at this moment, this notion of racial equity. What does it mean? Racial equity, then this condition that could be achieved if one's racial identity was no longer pre predicted in a statistical sense, um, I think needs to be really unpacked as we begin to, to talk about this notion um, for, for our young people. Equity involves trying to understand and give people what they need to enjoy full, healthy lives. Separate from, different, but connected to equality, um, which aims to ensure that everyone gets the same thing in order to enjoy full, healthy lives. So like equity, um, they each both to uh, promote this notion of social justice, but we have to begin to sort of unpack some things when it comes to racial equity to be able to dismantle be able to promote policies, be able to promote practices and programs and operating budgets to improve. More specifically, it's an opportunity to reflect or provide self-reflection on critical um, identities of, of inequity, begin to understand some of these traditions. So when we talk about dismantling the system of racism, white supremacy, prejudice in the US, we must re-educate, not only as we think of uh, the work of, uh, of, of, um, of um, when we talk about the miseducation of the Negro and uh, uh, Carter G. Woodson, not only educate black lives or the miseducation, but re-educate everyone to help them understand the public lynching of Emmett Till, to help them know um, the live times and justified legislation when we talk about um, justified racist policies of Jim Crow, uh, to be able to see the fruits of um, how this racist ideology came to pass about being black and blackness was bad. Um, and as, as we see here in this picture here, Kenneth and Mamie Clark, their doll test was something that really helped situate and allow Brown v. Board to come to pass to say that separate was not equal. And again, when we hear the words of King resonating and justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Moving forward to this notion of social change, um, talking about uh, 
mechanisms within social structures, structures characterize these changes of symbols, rules, behaviors, social organizations and values really speaks to this notion of comparative sensitivity. We have to be able to help our young people begin to understand, yes, history is important, but in order to have a lot of the social change, we have to sort of glean and, and get out of our myopic view and learning to understand about not only our own society, but other societies so we can have this social change. Beginning to move forward um, and what, what Gloria Ladson Billings talks about this culturally relevant pedagogy that we're not only knowing ourselves and how we're uniquely situated in these spaces and places, but also how others are uniquely situated in these spaces and places, how there's also a power differential amongst some other populations as well. So when we think about LGBTQ plus rights, when we think about the work of Patsy Mink and Title IX, when we think about James Meredith being ushered through to Ole Miss, when we think about the Americans with Disability Act, there are power differentials that we have to also keep in mind, understanding each other's challenges, but not only understanding and, and, and recognizing power and privilege, but also acknowledging the timing of all of this. As Dr. Harry Edwards says, there are seven waves of social activism and things happen at different times and different windows. And each individual during those spaces and times or each group had a moment and had an opportunity to um, open the door for the next generation. So we want our young people as we work with our, our institute individuals to be able to understand that as they move to the space of activism, to promoting social change, to using this campaigning to bring about political um, challenge and so at this last um, component here, I'll talk about this notion of critical sensitivity that needs to come to light. Critical sensitivity, really working to empower our youth, right? Um, to think and act critically, to problematize these conventional definitions of reality. One of the things our young people are on fire. They wanna do this work. They in many ways think demonstration is the only thing that they can do. Um, and they're there and that they are um, sort of the first ones to walk through this door but we're doing our best as we begin to speak into them and to share with them the literature. So they learn about such greats as Major Taylor. So they learn about the Black 14. So they know what Earlene Brown did. So they understand the role of the Harlem Globetrotters. So they understand what Kurt Flood's effort was. In each and every way of this, when we talk about Black athlete activism, we're seeing LeBron James speak as we saw on this screen. We're seeing this notion that Black Lives Matter as the NBA has espoused on its floor. There is a blueprint. Again, there is a window of time and there are multiple ways to take direct action. And um, those are some of the things that we are trying to speak into our young people at this time and place right now. At the end of the day, you know, the question was, you know, well, this notion of inequity, is it a time for a shift? Is it a time for a change? Yes, I think it is. I think it is. I think if we pull from the work of uh, and the, the, the teachings and lived experience of a John Lewis to stand up, to speak up, to speak out. We have to speak into our next generation because if, for many of us, we will not see the fruits of our efforts in our lifetime. So it's important that we pass the baton, I'm gonna use my track metaphor, to that next generation. But we also give them the skills and the tools that they need to be able to move the needle forward. Understanding history, understanding how they are in this space and, and, and in the context of society and also giving them the courage and the energy and the empowerment to speak up, to use their voice and to be the next generation of change. Thank you. Thanks a lot, um, Akila. Very interesting. I already have a few questions, but I will keep them. Um, like the others, please do send your questions by chat. Um, very stimulating talk, and to me at least, um, it's very interesting to see a different context, um, like in this case, the US context and, and, and your specific mm -hmm. story. Um, I want to right away give the floor to our next speaker, Professor Kevin Hilton of Leeds Beckett University. Um, so yeah, the floor is yours, uh, Kevin. If you have slides to share with us, please do. And otherwise, yeah, we just listen to you. Yeah. No slides. Okay, no slides. That's good. Um, but before I before I introduce myself, can I just check? Is that Su Young Lee that came to Leeds? Hi, Su Young. Hi. <laughs> she went back to South Korea and never came back to <laughs> to, uh, to the UK. It's good to see you, um, everyone. Thank you, uh, and Brent. Um, thank you for the invitation. 
um, to speak on this panel. Uh, I, I'm sorry I'm a, a little bit late, but I'll, I'll tell you why I was late in a minute. So my name is Kevin Hilton. I am Professor Emeritus at Leeds Beckett University and previously head of the, uh, the Research Centre for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. Um, I am, I am uh, one, of, one of my roles at the moment is I'm chair of a race equality commission in Sheffield. And this, this is one of those, those kind of once in a generation type um, uh, projects that, that, that all of us, all of us talk about uh, doing um, and kind of grasping it and then, and then hoping that we can make some sort of transformation to a, to a city region as a result. So I've just come out of a three hour meeting and uh, which I managed to finish uh, 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 two minutes early um, and, and to, to get here. What I, wanted, what I wanted to do today was just to present a polemic, really, uh, a stream of consciousness type um, presentation for you. I don't know if you've seen the title for my uh, presentation, uh, but Brent asked for one. And so I came up with pandemics, protests and pillow fights continuities and contradictions in sport. And then he said, I'm intrigued. And I was thinking, so am I, because I, had to, I still had, to, still had to, uh, to write it, but I had notes and, and so this is, this, is, this is where I'm at in terms of my, my thinking. So, so today I say that despite the increase in tensions, state sanctioned, the state sanctioned violence that Akila was just talking about, and awareness of racism at all levels. I maintain, and I, I go back to Gloria Ladson Billings, point that racism is normal, normal and not an aberration. That society is fundamentally racially stratified and unequal. Where power processes systematically disenfranchise racially oppressed people. Okay, that's a starting point for me. Why pandemics, protests, and pillow fights? The reason for this title is because like my colleagues here, I do work on race, racism, anti-racism, outside of these moments of public awareness of racism. A real fight. I don't feel as though I have the privilege to ignore racism. We, most of us here write things like sport is contested, a microcosm of society, and that racism and race are central to how we understand sport. Okay, today we see the continuities of public reactions to racism. Wider public awareness, dismay and calls for action, uh, finding their parallel manifestations in sport. So we see it out there and we see it in here. We also see there are many contradictions in sport because leaders in sport have been so ambivalent and passive in their general approach to systemic racism. And invariably, these leaders don't look anything like me or Akila who came, uh, who spoke before me. They often only react to individual behaviors that become public and therefore demand a response at that point thus leaving their own cultural practices and institutions intact. Not a real fight, but a pillow fight. Technically a fight, but a performance of a fight. The pillow fight is, is, is occurring because the recent global context has grabbed the collective consciousness to the point that the black voice that's been ignored in the past is being encouraged to speak. The black experienced, recognized, and the racial diversity that has been resisted by senior leaders in the past suddenly welcomed. Real fight or pillow fight? What sort of a fight can we expect when people aren't watching? 
The perfect storm of COVID and racial health inequalities conflating with the Black Lives Movement has led to an unrivaled level of performativity in reaction to racism. It also demonstrates that not all anti-racism is good. And in many cases, they waste resources and get in the way. Lots of talking without a lot of obvious doing. Ahmed describes this as doing the document, not doing the doing. What I do see in many cases in sport is a level of magical consciousness, which is super naive, that might be motivated by ideas of social justice, that Solazano and Yosso would, would describe as a conformist resistance. Hey, we're doing something, but we've no idea how it's going to work, but hey, we're doing something. What we actually need in sport is a transformational resistance that is informed by critical thought that's informed by social justice. Ledwith would call much of what we're seeing today as actionless thought, especially where racial disparities are already known, data are gathered, and gestural action, gestural action plans lead to unsatisfactory results actionless thought. I've also seen thoughtless action, like the take a knee protest in British association football. Um, some of you might call it soccer. Uh, that's why I've said associate. We'd normally just say football, but it gets very confusing on an international stage. Um, so this thought, thoughtless action. Uh, some of you may have seen some of the, the football in, in the UK where people are taking a knee. Um, I struggle with the idea of anti-racism as, as universally understood and equally rigorous. And I think Akila was getting at some of this earlier. It's a bit like diversity, equal opportunities, affirmative stroke, you know, positive action. There's a need for a critical understanding of what anti-racists are against, while the strategies for resistance to the problems must also be motivated by a long-term focus on social justice. I was recently shocked when the Queen's Park Rangers, which is actually an association football club, okay, at a high level uh, in, uh, in England, the Queen's Park Rangers director of football, ex-Tottenham Hotspur uh, uh, striker and England player, Les Ferdinand, he said that his team would no longer take, uh, uh, take the customary knee in support of Black Lives Matter. Akila, did you hear of that? You can nod because you're muted. Did you hear about that? Yeah. Um, he said, taking the knee will not bring about change in the game. It's a soundbite, PR, if you will. He argues that the gesture is just that, a gesture, and that its effect has now been diluted. He recently decided not to do any more interviews on racism in football because the debate was going around in circles. And, you know, Ferdinand was playing in the 80s, 90s, and, you know, he was playing at the highest levels, one of the highest profile black players of, of all time. Um, he asked the chilling but necessary question, will people be happy for players to take the knee for the next 10 years? And will people also be happy that there will be no progress over that 10 years? So for me, racism is pedestrian. It's not spectacular. It's not, you know, captured in the main on video or actually in the act. It is this that many do not understand which is why they are rarely prepared to deal with these incidents or spikes, these major incidents, because they're, they're not dealing with the systemic everyday stuff. And because they're not dealing with the systemic everyday racism, they're not equipped to mount a meaningful response, even to the most explicit manifestations of racism in their, their various sports. So this was, this was a, uh, something I wanted to, to get off my chest when, 
Brent, Brent asked me to, to say a few words today, and hopefully that gives you some indication of my thinking at that, at that time. It gives you some indications into why I talked about this idea of pandemics, protests, and pillow fights because of the kind of symbolic nature and the tokenism of the fights that were, that were and the resistance that we're seeing today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Gavin, for that uh, thought-provoking, I think, um, uh, talk. And I think also um, matches very well as a follow-up on, on Akila's talk. And, and basically, I think what I get from it, it's long-time commitment. It's not the spectacular that we need. It's focus on everyday racism. Um, and I think we, being researchers in this panel, mm. and very often having done this research for many years now, really recognize what you're saying. Um, yes. yes given that we try to impact also the associations, et cetera, but they are not always, yeah, maybe on, on, on that page, on that same page, they may want to have the spectacular and they want to make that statement, which gets out into the public um, and not so much focus on the everyday long-term. So thanks for that, um, uh, Kevin, that's, that's, that's nice, that's interesting. Um, okay, I, I, I uh, move on to the next um, uh, speaker. And now we move from England all the way to Australia. It's the, you know, the good thing about panels like this. We have many participants also from all, all over the world. I think ISA presentations uh, in a conference, in a live conference, don't always get this many you know, participants. So this is also a good thing in a way. Um, Barry, I would like to, Barry Jett, I would like to give the floor to you. Um, and um, yeah, also to, to, you know, to have you introduce yourself in some more, more detail if you, if you can. And you, I know that you have some slides with us to share, so please. Um, yeah, share the slides with us. Um, and in the meantime, I do see one questions in the chat. One question, please, I encourage everyone, please do use the chat function to ask questions if you have them, of course. And I think Barry needs to be unmuted as well. Maybe he can do it himself, right? I think, but, um... oh no, Brent, you, I think, have to, you have to do that, yes. Hi folks, good evening. Uh, my name is Barry Judd. I've evolved from Charles Darwin University to the University of Melbourne, where I am Director of uh, Indigenous Studies. And um, I really appreciate the first two speakers emphasising the Black Lives Matter movement and its relationship to sport. Uh, one thing that's peculiar to Australia is that the Indigenous peoples of Australia, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are both historically black and Indigenous. And this creates a particular circumstance for uh, anti-racism struggles in that settler colonial Australia uh, takes a great interest in the Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, overwhelmingly, I would suggest uh, regards racism as an American disease. And so one of the outcomes that we see, um, at least in the space I work, Indigenous Studies, is settler colonial Australia playing on social media sites in support of Black Lives Matter in the United States while denying the existence of racism against uh, Indigenous peoples at home. Uh, one of the things uh, that I wanted to do today was to point out the difference between football as it exists in Australia and in the United Kingdom and the United States. And I was going to speak to the history of Australian rules football, which is a particular uh, code of football that developed in Melbourne during the 19th century and which uh, is a sport of choice for Indigenous people in Australia today. And uh, this is where much of the anti-racism in sport has occurred through the uh, actions of Indigenous players. So I did want to reference the place where I live and acknowledge that I am speaking to you 
from the unceded country of the Kulin Nations, Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung people, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future. Um, and then I just wanted to spend some time, because it is an international audience, just outlining some history and then ending briefly with what has happened this year in the context of a very hard lockdown, um, at least in the Australian context with COVID-19. So uh, racism in Australian rules football uh, since the early 20th century, and particularly since the emergence of uh, Aboriginal players in the elite competition, racism has been a central characteristic of the sport. Uh, this code has been styled as the national game and is closely associated with settler Australian nationalism. And the sport really hasn't been a very pleasant place for Aboriginal players in the game. And I'll just uh, reference some uh, lowlights, if you like, of the history of our national game. 1927, a man called Doug Nichols uh, grew up on a Indigenous reserve, a highly restricted uh, area, high security risk. Uh, came down to Melbourne in 1927, uh, tried out with a football club called Carlton and had to leave because uh, trainers and teammates uh, thought he smelt. Uh, so Doug um, later became the state governor of South Australia and a member of the British Empire and a great leader uh, for Indigenous communities in Australia. Uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, um, a man called Robbie Muir, another Indigenous uh, person from the same area as Sir Doug, uh, was greeted uh, to his new football club in the elite competition by being urinated on by a senior teammate. And uh, this man was nicknamed Mad Dog uh, because he, uh, as well as being Indigenous, uh, probably had significant mental health issues as a result of racism and retaliated on the field and gained a really unfair reputation for being a troublemaker in the game. Uh, in the 1990s, um, same things were happening on the field. Uh, however, uh, there were changes in uh, the national population and attitudes to overt uh, racism and racial vilification and two Aboriginal men made stands during that decade, Michael Long and Nicky Winmar, and their uh, stand against racism, calling it out, um, compelled the Australian Football League to introduce what was called uh, Rule 30 in 1995 and racial vilification on the field was outlawed. The AFL was the first sporting body in Australia to actually address the issue of racism in this way. And it provided some protection to Indigenous players um, on the field, at least. However, um, Aboriginal players have not been fully protected from racism and uh, we've had a famous situation in Australia recently with Adam Goods, who in 2014, I think, became Australian of the Year for his anti-racism uh, work and community service. In uh, 2013, during Indigenous Round, a round that the League uh, holds to celebrate Indigenous people's presence and contributions, uh, a a 13-year-old girl called him an ape over the fence. He took offence to that and asked security to have her ejected from the ground. Um, and for the final three years of his career, uh, he became a victim of vilification that was organised. In the final year, he was booed out of the game, forced into an early retirement. Um, so he was scandalised, even though he is, um, you know, 
the most patriotic citizen you could actually find for calling these things out, but he became scandalised. Um, one of the un unintended consequences of Rule 30 and the focus on vilification as it occurs on the, on the field is that um, Australian sporting bodies have come to focus on this as the only indicator of racism and they do not see structural racism, casual racism, um, the racism that flows from the condition of coloniality which Indigenous peoples exist in as being racism to be dealt with. Um, so they've kind of used this uh, rule to get off the hook in many respects, um, to dodge bullets, to not address uh, some very real structural issues that are occurring in Australian sport. So what's happening now? Um, I'm making this quick. Um, we've been in a lockdown now forever. Um, at least that's my opinion. I moved to Melbourne from the Northern Territory, which you can see in the background uh, behind me in um, February and by March, uh, we were in lockdown and basically we've been in it ever since. Um, since 1877, uh, games of Australian football have attracted huge crowds in this city of 10,000 people going back to the 1860s and over 100,000 is normal in modern times. Uh, this year we have had no crowds, no games, and racism has not gone away in this context of the pandemic. Uh, what has happened is that racial vilification has moved from the ground and gone online. And this year there has been a spike in online racism uh, directed towards Aboriginal players uh, in the game of Australian football and other players of colour. And here are some examples. And uh, what has been the response so far? As I said, racism is uh, defined in this country as vilification. Uh, unsurprisingly, the people who run the Australian Football League are middle-aged, straight, white men from very privileged backgrounds. They have no understanding of what it means to be black, a person of colour, an Indigenous person, um, a person from a different uh, position in terms of gender or sexuality. Uh, these are things they do not understand. So uh, they've been very slow to move on this and it's taken Indigenous people themselves unsurprisingly to address this issue of online racism and uh, the most constructive thing that I'm aware of is a media personality putting together a petition to the Attorney General to uh, make these online racists um, operate in more difficult circumstances. So that's where we're at in Australia. Um, and I concur with the previous speaker that uh, Black Lives Matter brings racism to the broader um, public. Uh, but these things are things that people like me and the previous two speakers uh, deal with every day. And it's work that the public does not see, does not recognise, and most of the time does not value. Um, but it's, it's important work um, and it needs to go on forever, way past, uh, you know, beyond when the TV cameras uh, turn their attention to an issue beyond the current Black Lives Matter issue. So um, that's it for me, very late in Melbourne. I hope uh, that was useful to some of you in the audience and, and thanks to Brent for inviting me on. Thank you very, I, I think definitely very, very useful, very interesting. I, uh, yeah, I, I listened with great interest. Thanks for that. And, and also the, 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 
the online racism that that you that you addressed, um, I can imagine within these times, within within the pandemic. I mean, the online racism is something also to to take a closer look at. I don't know whether, for instance, in my country, the Netherlands, whether much research has been done on that topic. I think actually not. Um, so that's an in, in very interesting thing. And ag again, like the authorities don't really know how to respond to that, or they just don't respond to it, only focusing on the more explicit forms of racism. And even justifying maybe not responding by saying that they do respond to the explicit racism. So the more institutionalized forms of racism really do not get, get addressed, um, uh, as you say. So that, that, yeah, previous speakers also mentioned that, of course. Um, thanks a lot for that. Um, yeah, going on to um, our last, but definitely not least, speaker of today, moving to Taiwan. Uh, Xian Tian, I, I'm not sure if you have slides with us to share, um, but please do. And no, I will I'll just talk. I will just talk. Perfect. Uh, we will listen to you. The floor okay. is yours. Thanks, Jaco. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming in. Uh, my name is Su Xian Chen, or Xiang. Uh, like most people call me. Um, since I am the only panelist from Taiwan or Asia, so my talk is from a different perspective, uh, different kind of inequity, different kind of a protest. I'll focus on the international level of racial societal tension. And instead of, I mean, instead of racial societal tension or power relation within a nation, I wanna talk about inequity <laughs> in international arena and how sport, in pan uh, how sport in pandemics could be a vehicle to crack the status quo of the current international power dynamics. So the topic of my presentation is when pandemics miss nationalism, sport as a diplomatic propaganda. I'm not sure if you all know that, but Taiwan is one of the most successful countries containing COVID-19 in the past nine months or so being only a narrow strait away from the epicenter of the pandemics, Taiwan's 530 confirmed cases and seven deaths in total is an incredible feat, uh, almost a semi-miracle. Uh, everyday life for general public remains mostly intact uh, amid the pandemic. Microbes have often shaped human history, as Jerry Diamond argues in his highly popular book, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Germs have altered human history, but to what extent? This is the question. Diamond's work has drawn criticisms of um, oversimplifying the trajectory of civilizations. However, it is still a worthy departing point for my topic. Unlike Black Death to Europe, in, to medieval Europe, or smallpox to the Inca Empire, COVID-19 does not present a full-blown existential threat to the survival of our species, hopefully. And don't get me wrong, the COVID-19 pandemic is and will be a serious blow to the world in every possible way. But it will not be an upside down sort of mega change in the global scale. However, it may be leveling the playing field a little bit in the global scale and maybe cause a crack to the existing world system. That could be a turning point to global inequity. A peripheral country like Taiwan could seize a moment to potentially play a role in reversing the inequity. This is not the first time for Taiwan to face a tough epidemic, not even the first time in this century. In fact, if you recall, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and China suffered a major SARS crisis in 2003, which lasted almost three months. There were 346 confirmed cases, which led to 37 deaths on this island. The image, on, the image on the lockdown helping hospital became the heartbreaking reminder of Taiwan's tough fight against epidemics. As Michael Hurstfield argues, national embarrassment can become the ironic basis of intimacy and affection, a fellowship of the flaw, as he called. Within the private spaces of the national culture, uh, I'm sorry, uh, became the, uh, within the private spaces of the national culture. It was this kind of embarrassment that brought the nation together and forged a form of national sentiment that only the intimate members of the imagined communities could share and be consonant with each other. Diseases or epidemics are usually associated with negative connotations and bring embarrassment and shame to the sufferer. Taiwan would eagerly ditch the bad name when the opportunity presents itself. 
Andrew Morris applied this Hertzfield concept of cultural intimacy to Taiwan's participation in the Little League World Series in the 1970s. While Taiwan felt betrayed and ashamed by the international governing body when they were expelled by the United Nations in 1971, it was their Little League baseball teams become vicarious soldiers fighting for the nation's glory and restored their pride. The kids dominated the tournament, yet the glory was accompanied with a series of cheating scandals, such as improper assemble of the teams and inclusion of overage players. It was this kind of a bittersweet shame pride complex that has been driving the development of sports in Taiwan. When sports have the chance to carry the load of being a vehicle of national pride, they will be deployed. 17 years since South's outbreak, yet another epidemic is coming in in a much larger scale sweeping the world. Taiwan sees a moment to demonstrate what they have learned from the tragic lessons and turn this potential embarrassment into a chance to shine. As we all know, sports world hit the pause button for almost three months due to COVID-19. What you may not know is that Taiwan's professional baseball league became the first one starting the season, which started on April 12th. Later, they are also the first one to open the stadium to the fans on May 6th. Later, they are also the, uh, I mean, they enjoy the status of being the only baseball, if not sports available in the world so much that they started broadcasting their games to the world free of charge on Twitter and offer English commentary for the first time in their 31 year existence. Various branches of public office from national sport administration to city governments started to subsidize the teams and media outlets for pri providing English commentary. For the public sector, they want to seize the opportunity to promote, to promote not only Taiwanese baseball teams or players, they want to, they want to promote Taiwan per se. The government poured their money into baseball broadcasting in the name of tourism and international publicity. The PR strategy obviously worked. In their first five games broadcasted in English on Twitter, it drew over 5 million views and 60% of them coming from the USA, Taiwan's most significant ally in international affairs. The whole project also aims to promote Taiwan as a helpful role model country and has relative success in pandemic uh, prevention. During the broadcast, the achievement of Taiwan's CTC, CDC, that is, was frequently promoted. One of the team's Fubang Guardians commemorative Taiwan Zero jersey. Here it is. Inclu uh, that, that indicating zero cases in Taiwan became the best selling merchandise. This is a fortunate catastrophe for Taiwan. Don't take it the wrong way. By that, I mean it was absolutely unfortunate for the human beings around the world who suffered from this pandemic. Yet it levels the playing field a little bit, or at least a crack in the world system. Because the chance is rare for a nation who has been overshadowed and often annihilated in the international society. For Taiwan, which is not even a world of WHO, it was a time for them to distinguish themselves. This is their way to protest protest against the world in inequity and meet pressure from the PRC. So from 50 years ago, Taiwan was known for their dominant little league teams. The state machine was hitting on all cylinders behind the teenagers. 50 years later, baseball is still the vehicle driven by the state for nationalistic pride amid the pandemics. And not just baseball, domestic football and basketball leagues also enjoy their 15 minutes of fame by getting the subsidy from the government for their English broadcast on YouTube. I call it a 15 minute of fame for obvious reason. With Korean baseball start playing and sharing the spotlight later and other major sports league coming back to play in the empty stadium nonetheless. The novelty wore off and the level of play of Taiwanese baseball could no longer satiate the global audience. The latest broadcast drew less than 2000 views globally. So compared with the PRC's grand propaganda machine, it is Taiwan's micro propaganda, a private, a, a public private joint effort to promote via micro blog. That is when the pandemic's meeting nationalism, it is a way to shake the existing world order. To what extent remains to be seen. 
it is still a long way to go to, pay, to break or even reverse the dynamics of the world system in Emmanuel Wallerstein's sense. But at least it could offer a glimpse of hope for the peripheral. And hopefully it could be a turning point. Thanks for your listening. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that, um, Xian. Great, interesting. I mean, you look at it again from a different angle than the other presenters. You 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 take another perspective, which I think is really um, uh, interesting as well. To to also what you say to also how sport is being used as a tool for national pride, um, especially within the context of, of the pandemic, having the first baseball matches, you know, uh, screened English commentary, etc., to promote Taiwan. That's uh, I, I remember in Europe, for instance, when I think the football, the soccer, uh, again, took place after, you know, the lockdown. I think the German clubs, the football clubs were the first yeah. ones yeah. To, to participate on the professional level. And it got a lot of attention, I, I'm sure, in every nation in, in Europe, for sure in the Netherlands. And it's kind of a way to also show, look, we're doing this and we can do this. Um, and, and yeah, like you say, with Taiwan, that, that, that mechanism was also being used, I think, uh, to, in a way to promote Taiwan, like you say. Very interesting. Okay, um, well, we, I, I, first of all, I want to thank the presenters for um, having these really interesting presentations, but also for being disciplined, like 10 minute presentations, really great. And you have shared with us um, within these 10 minutes, really the, yeah, I think very interesting content. There is still uh, some time for, um, for questions. Um, I think about, uh, yeah, 15 uh, minutes. Um, so, um, please do share with us questions uh, in the chat. I do have one question from the chat that I will um, anyhow pose. And yeah, in addition to that, I have some, some comments about the great talks that you delivered, um, right? So that's, uh, that's another comment, but that's not really a question, of course, but still good to share with you. So one of the questions that you have also probably seen uh, uh, in the chat is that uh, was, was directed specifically at um, Professor Hilton. Um, so first I want to yeah ask, uh, Kevin, whether you can address that, but maybe the other panelists have their own ideas on it. And it's basically about, um, about how sport associations, in particular football associations, in this case soccer associations, <laughs> how they can um, address racism in a better way, not only focus on the spectacular, like Professor Hilton mentioned, but also on the everyday in the long term change. Uh, how can authorities, sport authorities, do that in a better way? And how can they also, uh, as a follow-up question from the same person, how could then um, sport associations make sure that this also goes down in the organization to the, to the you know, to the people working on, on yeah, on, on the on the floor? How, what can be done there? What can be improved? Um, yeah. Yeah. Professor Hilton, can I ask you to uh, yes, address? Yes, of course, of course. Yaka, you, you don't need to call me professor. We've known each other long enough. <laughs> I know, but still, you're a professor. Emeritus professor yeah. now, I might say, but yes. Yeah. Yes. I was going to say you can, you can call me sir, if you like. <laughs> well, don't <laughs> <help>. <laughs> uh, So my, my, my response uh, is that, at least in, in football, this, this question was, was directed at football, um, the, the, the problem is that the culture of football has been allowed to go unfettered. Um, th there's a, a lack of coordination um, across organisations and the, the, across the organisation of football, the, the landscape of football, if you like, and at the highest levels from, the, from FIFA down to the, the, the national uh, bodies and then, uh, and then you've got the leagues and, and so on. So where there is weak leadership um, at, the, at the highest levels, the, the culture will be allowed to kind of perpetuate itself. And we see, you know, we, we've seen this. And some of the things that, that, that um, the, the academics have been writing about since the 70s, uh, the 60s and 70s, because um, of course there was, there was reference to Harry Edwards uh, earlier, um, you know, are, are still uh, are still points of conversation today. They just might <clears throat> might not be as popular points of conversation because, of course, we've moved on to talking about other things. Like <clears throat> Barry was talking about, you know, online 
uh, racism going online. So those that, you know, so we're talking about the virtual world now. Um, but those, you know, so, but some of the original problems, problematics that we were writing about that people were writing about in the 60s and 70s. I'm not even going to suggest I was writing about it in the 70s, but I was definitely writing about it in the 80s, um, are still still issues <laughs> for, for, for today. And Barry, um, uh, the, the racism g going online, I'm currently doing some research uh, on um, online racism and Islamophobia in the English Premier League and uh, English Football League. So across the fo top four divisions, uh, in in England and and I'm I think it's I'm in, in, well I'm not I'm not incredulous because my my our field work didn't really cover um, the, the the kind of lockdown period uh, but it, it, I'm really keen to find to 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 read your your um, conclusions your findings around how racism has has migrated to to online spaces for indigenous indigenous players. So it's about leadership, it's about culture and coordination. That was that was my response. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, uh, Kevin. Are there other panelists? Because I think it's uh, one of the key questions, right? How to really um, um, address the associations and to, to to you know to 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 make them work on this in a better way. Are there other? For instance, Akila, I, I noticed you have mentioned a critical sensitivity as one of your concepts that you try to bring to your internship students as far as I understood but it could also be brought, brought of course to the managers and the leaders how can you can you bring in that yeah. concept here as well um definitely you know and I'll, I'll I'll kind of focus and center on college athletics uh in the U.S. Uh, just because again we've got these a number of young people um and I that were born in 2000 so their <laughs> their knowledge and understanding of the world is very different is very unique um and um, one of the things that I often think about in the space of college athletics, we know it's gone through a number of changes, a number of reforms and propositions in all aspects of its governing body when we talk about student athletes, from academics to performance to injury, to food and nutrition, to mental health and wellness that have to be talked about since this, again, 1906 when it started. But when we have the confluence of COVID-19, racial unrest, it's also eliminating a number of deficiencies within these athletic departments, um, not only to their ability to um, navigate racial terrain, but also just their ability to navigate um, student development terrain. Um, and so I found it very interesting that, um, in, that, that these organizations will also have to get on board when it comes to educating themselves, understanding the history, pulling that into context, understanding the difference and challenges that are going on, not only in college sports, but bring in what's going on in the world to that space, because those young people are coming from those environments. We've got young people, and one of the things I, I, I didn't fully unpack in the presentation, but many are wrestling with, in many cases, PTSD, because they've had their own racialized experiences as young people, and then are coming into this college space, and all is supposed to be good. And in many ways, they're still unpacking those challenges and coming to their own. And I think one of the things that we have to understand for our leadership is that, uh, you know, in many respects, to be clear, money um, and arguably, again, the, the black body has led to the decisions and the creation of these policies, you know, and, and how they begin to formulate. When we think about academic tutors and, um, you know, the things that come forth, the 40, 60, 80, we're looking at those revenue producing sports where primarily those numerical representations are black bodies. So the athletic departments would really have to operate in a different conceptual <laughs> framework, right? One that centers the development of college athletes and their culture. Um, but this would be problematic because it would really in many ways misalign with the establishment of their economic rubric, if you will, and their measurement for success. So it's going to have to be a, a space and time where, to um, Kevin's point, Professor's point, right? Um, <laughs> we've got to sort of, you know, revamp the way that they're structured and that organization and the way that they kind of do operate business. Will that come to fruition? I don't know, you know, um, mm -hmm. because money is something that, you know, for the U.S. Um, perspective in college athletics, 
that's how we operate. They're trying to figure out, you know, how can we, <laughs> I mean, I just got an email now about some pop-ups <laughs> for students for the athletic program. And I'm like, are we concerned about their mental health or being? Are we concerned about, you know, their nutrition? Are we concerned about their health and safety? Because in many respects, they are having to make these young people, again, 18, 19, 20 years old, are having to make life and death, just left life and death decisions of do I return to play? So. Yeah, thanks, Sakila. I, I, I also am I'm thinking of the, um, the, the, yeah, the thing that Barry, um, that you mentioned in, in, in the Adams Goods um, um, context, it's a different context, different question, but still I had to think of this when Akila was talking about the fact what can players or athletes themselves do when they are kind of mm -hmm. these celebrity athletes. And, but, but the reactions towards Adam Gooch were quite, I mean, he was uh, scandalized, you say, when he spoke out against racism that he experienced, right? Uh, at the same time, we know from the US, uh, Colin Kaepernick uh, as well, right? He was, mm -hmm. when he spoke out against racism, it became very difficult for him. So, but at the same time, we have England where some players like Raheem Sterling, but people from England know better. But I have the feeling myself that when, Raheem Sterling spoke out against racism. He was not scandalized to that extent uh, compared to, for instance, Colin Kaepernick, not, not at least by the mainstream media, let's say. I've spoken to many journalists in England and they basically say, well, we've become more aware of it because of Raheem Sterling. At the same time, they don't do much. They, they don't act on it. But anyhow, they don't scandalize him explicitly. Like, So what, what's the mechanism behind this, this scandalizing? If, if, so if someone speaks out against racism in, in, in the Australian context, for instance, let me keep it because you mentioned this example. What's the mechanism behind people then reacting in that way? So are you, who are you directing the question at? Is it Akira? Are you, uh, yes, I, I would say to, to, yeah, to you if, if it's possible, because you know probably best the Australian context and the Adam Goods uh, case. So you're directing you say, it at me? Sorry. Barry, to Barry. Barry. Barry okay. Oh, okay. Um, look, I, I think both, um, all the speakers referenced history and um, history is something that Settler Australia does not know um, and has really yet to come to terms with. And it's the case in this country also that we're talking about a population of Indigenous people that's about 3% of national population. Most Australians know Indigenous people uh, through the stories of former colonists. So sport's really important in that context because when they watch football matches on TV, that's where they're most likely to see Indigenous bodies uh, running around on their TV sets. Um, one way to think about Indigenous people and racism in Australia is to really reference Edward Syed's work on Orientalism and to consider that uh, the discursive, uh, discursive representations of race are so powerful here that they create a alternate reality that has nothing to do with actual life in Australia, but Indigenous men in particular um, experience racialized gender uh, biases uh, or, or gendered racism, rather, uh, whereby um, these old stories are referenced. And there is a situation in Australia today where black, black Indigenous if they're not sports people, if they're not musicians, they're normally represented as criminals, pedophiles, and um, people who beat up their wives and abuse their children. Um, and regardless of Adam Goods being a multimillionaire and a, a, a former sports star, um, he is tarred with the same brush uh, as we all are. Anyone who claims an Indigenous identity uh, immediately has question marks raised about their character. And uh, to put your head over the parapet, so to speak, and to call out racism uh, just makes you a, a, an immediate target for 
that historical baggage. And, you know, I, I always think about Franz Fanon and um, reference his, um, you know, his uh, picture of being on the, on the train carriage in France and, and having the weight of history placed upon his body. Uh, which had nothing to do with him as a man, but uh, everything to do with European racism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I can see um, the point you're making. Thanks for that. Um, I go to the chat because there we, yeah, I'm conscious of time, so we don't have that much time anymore. So I want to move on to a question that comes in, um, which is, I will read it out. Many of you mentioned that racism is not being seriously addressed at the highest level, like executive levels. So some people might say we should introduce a racial quota for high level positions to provide and bring to light different race issues. And then the question would be, however, most of us come from democratic societies where our stance is best meant for the job. That person should get the job and, 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 and such a ruling or policy may result in person who although can bring out different perspectives, but are not suitable on the best people for the job. The last thing I can't completely grasp but i think it refers to yeah so it's it's very often the um i think the reaction from associations when it's about quota for instance yeah but we need just the best man for the job and then and that that's probably the response from associations that's how i read this question uh, but you can read it yourself of course in the chat is there any panelist who wants to answer to that question and you can also have a different interpretation of the question, right? That's that's perfectly yeah. fine. Yeah. I, I think I, I think um, that that this that this is a uh, um, it, it's not meant to be a provocative question. I think it's a, it's a straightforward question. Um, but I, I think it's 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 always interesting for me when I have these these discussions because these dis discussions are at a point where we're often challenging the status quo, uh, the, the, the status quo that isn't a meritocracy that suddenly becomes a meritocracy when there's a call to, to um, redistribute resources um, and, and to address uh, diversity. So, so what, we, what we need to recognize is that, that sometimes the system will defend itself and it defends itself at these points where we're, we're, we're calling for um, diversity to be uh, to be addressed. Um, so, uh, so, so, I, so I do I do have a, an issue with uh, with those those calls about quotas and, and and what have you. But I think that that where where organisations where where sports are historically. Uh, inequitable for whatever reason, we should be prepared to redistribute resources, um, to be prepared to be inequitable ourselves, to uh, to take resources away from re uh, uh, um, well-resourced areas, and uh, and and even to well-resourced communities, to to uh, to those that are underserved and and underrepresented. We talk about. In the UK, we talk about positive action. In in other countries, they might they might talk about affirmative action, but they are ways to do this 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 sort of thing to to approach uh, uh, um, these these imbalances, the, these disparities in uh, in sport. And there are there are in in the British context the the, the code of governance um, for. for for national governing bodies that's that's been written by the UK Sport and Sport England says at the moment that there should be at least 30% of women on national governing bodies and it's being rewritten now to in, to include uh, 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 ethnic di ethnic diversity so there's there's a recognition by governing by governing bodies at the at the highest level that quotas can work and should be used. Um, so, so I don't, I don't have a, I don't have a problem with with quotas being being used, as long as the and or positive action being used or affirmative action being used, where they're part of a 
comprehensive um, um, a, a, a comprehensive framework of action. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, thanks for that contribution, Kevin. Um, listen, uh, I'm, I am conscious of time, as I said, and uh, we agreed uh, on finishing within one hour, 15 minutes, which is more or less now. So um, I'm sorry, because the discussion to me is very interesting, and I, I'm sure to many others. But please, you know how to get in touch with, with the presenters or with each other. Um, some of you may be really tired because it's very late or very early in the morning. Uh, still, I hope it was uh, stimulating, intellectually stimulating. For me, it was. Um, but I'm, of course, here in the middle of the afternoon, so I'm not tired, but I hope it was for all of you. Um, so have a nice evening, night, rest of your day. Um, and thanks, for, uh, thanks a lot for, for, for this to the presenters and to all the participants. And uh, take all good care in the coming months. Bye. Thanks, Jaco. Thanks, Jaco, Barry, Kevin, Akila, Sean. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, guys. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, friends. Great stuff. Good Kevin, to see you, Kevin. Kevin, we got a chat. <laughs> Pardon? I said we got a chat about <laughs> uh, chat. in a little bit. Yeah, so check your I email agree. and let us know when's a good day and time. OK, I will do. <laughs> Brent, <laughs> okay, thank you. So okay. Jaco, we got to talk, too, because I, I know we got to meet to check, check in as well. So thank you so much. It's breakfast yes. time over here. <laughs> Big time here. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. Enjoy Good your luck. sleep. Okay. Thanks. Take Jeez. care. Bye bye. Bye bye, bye, -bye guys. Bye. Bye bye. There we go.